You're good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Just went right off the chat window, so you're muted, mm -hmm. and the speaker is off. And this this is Adriana, is that her name? I didn't bother paying attention. Adriana. Adriana, okay. Do we know the other people coming? We can put them in too if you want to. Do we put the other students' names in? Um, I'm not sure, but I'm not positive, but Stephanie is one and Denise is the other. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, This is Adriana Stephanie. Who's the other person? Denise. Oh, Denise? Mm -hmm. A S D. When would you like to start? You ready? ready? Let's do it. Okay. Howdy, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Jason Dean, and I'm the director of special collections here at Southwestern University. On behalf of the Associated Colleges of the South True Stories Project, and in partnership with the Latina History Project, I'd like to welcome our webinar speaker, Dr. Brenda Sendejo. Dr. Sendejo is a faculty member in the Anthropology Department at Southwestern University. She is the faculty co-director of the Latina History Project at Southwestern University and a faculty partner on the Associated Colleges of the South True Stories Project. Her publications include a chapter in the edited collection, Flushing the Spirit, Spirituality and Activism in Chicana, Latina, and Indigenous Women's Lives. In her talk today, Dr. Sendejo will share her expertise and experience using oral history methods in her research and courses, including the Spirit Stories, Narratives of Social Justice and Spirituality Oral History Project and the Latina History Project. Please feel free to submit questions to Dr. Sandejo using the chat function. And if you're just joining us, um, welcome. Um, and make sure that your participant audio is muted so everybody can hear Dr. Sandejo really well. And there'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end through the chat box that you have on your screens. Um, and without further ado, Dr. Sandejo. Great, thank you so much, Jason. Um, I'm really happy to have the opportunity to talk with you all today, so thanks for tuning in. Um, I wanna thank um, Jason Dean for his work with our students here um, in the archival work that we're doing with the Latina History Project. And also, I'd like to give um, a lot of thanks to all the work that's been done by the principal investigators of the True Stories Project. I'm really excited to be part of this multidisciplinary um, project. So thank you to Charlotte Nunes, Caitlin Christian Lane, and to Rachel Watson. It's very exciting to be part of this. So today I'm going to give you a little bit of insight into some of the things that I've explored through my research and teaching around oral history. This is just kind of a drop in the bucket. There's so much to examine and explore within this theory and method of oral history. So I hope this will give you a little bit of um, kind of a primer on how to conduct oral history and also give you some insight into the kinds of research we're doing at Southwestern with our students and faculty and staff around oral history through two of the projects I've worked on here um, at, at Southwestern. I also want to acknowledge the work of our students and an alum who's working with us right now, Tori Vasquez, Nani uh, Romero, uh, Stephanie Garcia, and also Denise Ovale have been doing very important work with us, and so I want to acknowledge and thank them as well. So I'm going to go ahead and start with my PowerPoint. This presentation, uh, PowerPoint presentation, will also be available on the True Stories website to you, um, as will this recording um, on the landing page after uh, we're done with the presentation. So uh, without further ado, let me go ahead and start by giving you 
um, a bit of an overview. I chose a voice memory power and the recovery of the past as part of my title today because I think that these are some really important uh, concepts and ideas and, and, and words in thinking about oral history, um, right? The, the degree to which voice is represented, um, which voices are represented, who has the power to, to create history, to make history, um, how is memory work in this idea of sort of recovering the past, um, and the ways in which we do think about um, um, history and how it impacts our understanding of not just uh, the past, but of our present. And so these are some of the kind of frames that are going to situate my talk today. So thank you again for tuning in, and I'm going to give you a bit of an overview. This is kind of what I'm going to look at today with regards to this presentation. So I'll give you a bit of an introduction, what inspired me to engage in oral history as a researcher, as a student, and just a couple of personal anecdotes in terms of what inspired me to, to become interested in oral history. Um, a couple of definitions, uh, approaches that I use in my own research that lies at the uh, intersection of Chicana feminist history and theory, of uh, feminist research methods um, in anthropology, and also the importance of oral history as a social justice tool. I'll delve into um, some techniques within conducting oral history as a, as a research method, and then I'll give you a little bit of insight into two of the oral history projects that I have been able to work with here at Southwestern with students. So first, a little bit of context. Um, this is an image from a panel that um, I helped to produce for an exhibit on the uh, women of La Rasuni, the political party, that I engaged in with uh, graduate students at the University of Texas when I was there conducting my PhD research. Um, I had a personal connection to wanting to know more about this, the histories of, of Tejanas, or Texas Mexican women, um, through my own sort of uh, lack of knowing about my own history. So growing up in South Texas, I didn't know a lot about my own history and past. And so when I went into an undergraduate class in, in UT Austin and learned about the Mexican American Civil Rights Movement, I was forever changed and inspired. And that really led me to a deep, deep interest in wanting to know my own history um, because I hadn't known about it. So because of that, and because I did not know that um, my own history was very important, uh, nor what it was, um, I decided to make part of my work um, inspiring students to ask the questions about their own histories. And oral history is one way I do this in my classes. I invite students to engage in uh, conducting oral histories with their families, with their community members, in efforts to learn more about their own histories and pasts. Um, so one of these, again, was the Mujeres de la Raza Unida, um, Oral History Project at UT Austin. The thing about oral history that I find so uh, compelling is that it not only is about recovering the past and about voices that have not been represented in historical narratives, but it also can lead us to um, pursue deeper questions, right, about um, society, about people's experiences, um, and so that's exactly what happened with me with my involvement in this um, exhibit and the oral history project on women's involvement in Texas politics. Um, the third political party, La Raza Unida, was very active in Texas from the 1970s. It, it was formed in 1970 through 1978, and women were a big part of that. So when I started learning about this, these histories, as you can see on this panel, we included photographs and quotes from the, from the oral histories we collected with these women um, into this exhibit. But as I started digging deeper, I started realizing there was some really interesting kind of cultural phenomenon at play that I wanted to, to delve into more deeply. And so that actually inspired my PhD research. And so this is kind of a way that oral history can help to inform um, academic research, but also community involvement and community um, history projects. Um, another example of an oral history project I took on was the Voces oral, oral History Project, um, which is an oral history project um, that is out of UT Austin. It is an oral history project that works to uh, create a better awareness of the contribution of U.S. Latinos and Latinas of the World War II, Korean War, and Vietnam generations. And my involvement in that yielded uh, my participation in um, a publication, whereas I drew on oral histories I conducted with women of the World War II generation, uh, Tejanas, um, 
and wrote an article about the ways in which they have informed the Chicana generation in terms of political and feminist consciousness. So again, here are just two examples of how my training in oral history methods and theory and cultural anthropology um, really kind of um, melded together um, with uh, oral history projects I've been a part of um, to yield this really interesting kind of uh, feminist um, critique of looking at sort of cultural phenomenon in the Texas-Mexico borderlands. So two examples. Um, next, I'm going to go into oral history, some definitions and approaches. Um, so there are many ways that we can describe oral history in terms of um, definitions of oral history. Because it's an interdisciplinary um, research method, there are lots of disciplines that use oral history. And I'm just going to give you one very general sort of definition of oral history, but again, it's, it's really dependent on context. Um, so here I have oral history as a method of collecting information about the past and preserving that past by ways of interviewing a person or group of people about a historical event, era, place, and or time. Um, so as we think about that, um, I'd like for you to think about the ways in which um, oral history can be used in history, information sciences, anthropology, sociology, uh, social work, education, uh, Chicana, Chicano studies, many other disciplines um, use oral history. Um, the interviewer in oral history, uh, it's really important to think about the interviewer as an active listener, right, in this process, who looks to learn from the interview participant. So this learning process is really an important part of the oral history project and engagement, right? Um, to understand deeply what it's like to live life as that particular person, it really requires this important active listening. Um, the oral historian gathers data through the interview and uses that to sort of create a picture, if you, if you will, by way of a basically an essay, a book, exhibit, or other means, right? Gathering these kinds of histories and, and creating a picture. And again, these can take these various different forms. Um, Oral histories work to preserve a piece of history and individuals interpretations of their experiences as part of that larger history. Now again, these histories may very well um, be counter histories to uh, larger historical narratives uh, that maybe don't include the voices of underrepresented individuals. And this is one of the things um, that, that makes oral history so powerful and a social justice tool. Um, so oral history involves getting someone else's perspectives that's either similar or unique to that time period and his or her culture. Um, it's an important method used, again, by um, all kinds of scholars, also community members who engage in oral histories in their communities in order to present um, part of their history as, as maybe a city's wider history, right? Um, while dominant groups typically do have their histories recorded through historical documents, books, and other means, underrepresented groups and perspectives, their histories are oftentimes um, in the shadows, right, or, or actually not included in some ways. And so in this way, oral history helps to recover the past and the experiences of groups who are um, underdocumented, right? Um, this can happen on local, regional, national, and global scales um, through well-documented or not so well-documented experiences of individuals such as women, ethnic minorities, religious minorities, working class individuals. Um, there are projects on histories of disabled individuals, communities, um, and individuals within the LGBTQ communities, activism, various social justice movements, um, and other kinds of, of instances. There are probably thousands of oral history projects around the nation and the world that look at various kinds of experiences and histories. Um, so just a little bit of uh, insight into anthropological approaches, um, because that is one of the things that I use in my own research. Um, so within my discipline of cultural anthropology, oral histories and traditions are considered really important sources of information. So they're valuable information that are known to transmit and generate messages within a group. Um, examining these allow for these various kinds of questions to emerge that could use further um, exploration, right? So for example, how and why different attitudes and beliefs have been developed over time, right? Uh, under what historical and social circumstances, perhaps ideas around religious ideology or political beliefs or uh, thinking around race and the construction of race or gender, for example. Um, 
this intersects with my perspectives and um, research that draw on feminist methodology. So I'm going to delve into that just a little bit here to give you another kind of approach. And again, there are many, many approaches to conducting oral history, and these are just a couple of them I use in my own work. So according to feminist historian Joan Sangster, she says, quote, oral history is a methodology informed by feminist debates around research methods, objectives, questions, and the use of interview material, end quote. So these feminist debates involve examining um, the ways in which women and other individuals sort of construct a historical memory. That is, how do people explain, rationalize, and make sense of their pasts? And how can this offer insight into the social um, and material realities in which they operated, right? So in this way, sort of feminist methods help us to sort of look um, at power relations, but also sort of how the construction of memory and how and what people remember help us to understand their experiences. Um, it also allows for um, opportunities for new spaces to be um, understood um, and for theory to emerge and the ways in which things like class, race, ethnicity, and gender affect how people remember, right, the construction of memory. So again, just uh, another kind of approach uh, using feminist methods. Um, finally, oral history is a social justice tool. There are several um, oral history projects, um, at, uh, even here in Texas, that really work to to bring out of the shadows different kinds of experiences, oftentimes with individuals who have um, experienced perhaps racial gender oppression. Um, and so what oral history does as well is to bring to light these experiences so that we understand our history um, and can correct sort of the past uh, wrongs, if you will. Um, so it's about the power of voicing the past, right? And sort of bringing these experiences to light so we can understand um, our history and also work to correct it, right? Um, so I'd like to move on now to the next slide, which will delve into oral history as methods. So here I'm going to kind of get into the nuts and bolts of actually doing uh, oral history. So again, these are just some of the things that I pull out from my own teaching in oral history with my students. Um, some things that I think are, are some uh, important things to consider, uh, generally speaking. Now, oral history can be done in lots of contexts, as I mentioned previously. Um, if you are a student, if you are a faculty member, a staff member, and you would like to engage in an oral history project at your own university, or if you'd like to do it in the context of a class, these will help you. But if you're just interested in interviewing your uh, great aunt or your grandfather or someone in your own family, that's very possible. And there are lots of oral history um, resources online and through various projects that can help you to do that and these will offer some of those kinds of techniques in these next uh, few points. So the pre-interview preparation, very important to the oral history interview is being prepared, right? So you have a bit of a homework to do as the interviewer. Um, I have offered a pre-interview form for my students when I assign oral histories. Um, this is really helpful because it's important to familiarize yourself with the history and background information of the interviewee. So for example, in my uh, Latino and Latina spiritualities course, students are exploring religious and spiritual practices and histories of individuals. So in this case, I've shared with students that knowing a bit about this background on the interview is very important so that if you come against um, a practice or you come up to discuss a practice with an individual and you're not familiar with that practice, um, it's important to know that that is something that they'll likely speak about. And if you're not familiar with it, do a little bit of research so that you can familiarize yourself with it, at least some of the context. Um, so that you don't, one, so that you know the kinds of questions that you can ask that individual, but two, um, so that you'll um, be familiar and won't have to use a lot of the precious oral history time, the interview time, um, to delve into too much background, right? You will have already done a lot of your homework. So on that note, um, sometimes you also have to keep into consideration how much time you're actually going to spend and how much time the person is available to spend with you with the conducting the interview. And, and realize, too, that people can get tired after a certain amount of time. So um, I'd say maybe 45 minutes to an hour is a good amount of time to think about conducting an interview. But again, it depends on the individual and their availability. So next, um, I'd like to share a little bit about consent forms. So again, this, this really does depend on the context. If it's an oral history project within the context of a university setting, for example, here at, the, at Southwestern, we do use consent forms for our Latina history project. Um, 
It's important to have consent forms provided to individuals and have them filled out prior to the interview. You want to detail what's going to happen in the interview in this consent form so that there aren't any surprises. And um, this also goes along with sort of ethical considerations for conducting oral history, right? We want to be sure that people are understanding the purposes and the uses of these oral histories, whether it be for publication, for a conference presentation, if it's just something that you plan to use for the purposes of just a classroom that's not going to be shared, be sure that you're very transparent about all of this with the interviewee. The consent form will also offer um, an opportunity uh, if you like to provide this to the interviewee, and it's always a good reciprocal um, opportunity to offer this to the interviewee, and that's note that you will offer them a copy of the interview and or a transcription of their interview if they wish for, to have one. So moving on um, to a very important aspect of the oral history, and that's developing strong questions. Um, one thing to remember is it's very important to open to ask open-ended questions, right? So try to stay away from anything that will elicit a yes-no response. Or if you do ask a question like that, be sure to ask follow-up questions. So can you say a little bit more about that? Or can, can you give me some background on an experience where you um, – um, where this particular instance occurred, etc. cetera. Um, so these kinds of questions, you want to start by preparing a list of questions. So you can either talk about this preliminary list of questions with um, your, your instructor, or you can um, even share them with the interviewee before the interview. Um, but you do want to make sure you have a list of, of questions to go off of. Um, Remember, you already have that pre-interview form information, so you don't necessarily have to spend a lot of time reiterating um, the kinds of biographical questions that you will have already asked, such as, you know, where, where did you grow up, or, or uh, what year were you born, those sorts of things. You have that information. But rather, perhaps, can you describe what it was like growing up, for example, as a Mexican-American in Jim Crow South during that period, right? Um, because you have some of that context already. Um, Learning how the person felt about major life issues um, might also help you to understand your interviewee and how they see their life as a whole, right? So it might be help to ask questions about what it was actually like to live through things like, as I mentioned, Jim Crow South, segregation, the Vietnam War, right? These are things that will give you insight to a particular historical time period if that's where your uh, particular topic is headed. Um, as you ask your questions um, and you work from your list, be sure to ask those follow-up questions. If you don't understand a response or if you would like um, your uh, interviewee to elaborate, it's very important to ask them to do so at that time um, rather than perhaps later on because their memory will be um, very connected at that time to that particular instance and it will be a little bit easier to get them to share that information. But don't be afraid to ask those follow-up questions. Um, always asking things like, can you say more about that or can you do detail that or can you remember a particular instance those are things that will help elicit a little bit more information um, a response to one of your questions might also trigger a curiosity about some other issue um, that you want to follow up with and it's our, always good to be ready um, to go down a, a path that you're not uh, anticipating so be open about that as well because a lot of it really information interesting information can come out of that um, Another thing when thinking about the questions, um, such as asking how and why things happen, um, is thinking about the ways in which um, the interviewee's perspectives on various kinds of issues um, would play out if you were to ask various kinds of questions. Um, so again, feel free to think about relating different kinds of concepts to things um, and asking them to, to uh, relay various kinds of memories. Um, asking for clarifications on things you don't understand and that kind of thing are very important. So uh, again, a little bit more during the interview, what to expect. Um, equipment, a very, very important aspect of the interview. Um, if you have the ability to have two forms of recording, um, that is the best. If you can perhaps have a uh, handheld device or a and or a computer, um, a phone that will record, the backup is, also, is always very important if you can have that. Double up your batteries. I have been uh, in situations where I wish I had had ex extra batteries. You just never know. And you may not be able to recreate that instance of conducting an oral history with someone. So be sure that you are you're double prepared when it comes to the equipment. Test it out, all of that sort of thing. There's nothing worse than going through an entire hour of oral history interview, getting some really, really rich information and realize your recorder's not on. So 
Um, another aspect of that, um, try not to spend too much time taking too many notes. That's what the recorder is for. Um, you want to engage with and be an active listener in the oral history um, interaction. Sometimes uh, when we're dealing with topics like religion and spirituality or talking about Texas history, a lot of times people, you know, they're really uh, deep stories and sometimes they can be painful to recollect. So we want to be very active listeners. People are sharing their histories and their lives with us and it's um, important to, to be active listeners. So if you do take notes, perhaps make them, you know, just uh, very uh, infrequent and make notes about the follow-up questions that might come to mind for you. When it comes to oral history, there are ethical concerns um, that should be considered. Um, a couple of those include the following. When should you turn off the recorder? Um, there are instances where people may re recollect different kinds of experiences that elicit strong feelings or uh, people may cry. Uh, at that point, you would want to ask them if they'd like for you to turn off the recorder. That's very important to be um, conscientious about um, how they're feeling and, and recollecting um, if they need a moment. Um, if there's anything that they talked about that they, in retrospect, would not like you to include in any kind of public format or publication of the interview, it's important to respect that as well. Um, and of course, issues of confidentiality are really important. Um, again, depending on the topic, some of the topics may be very serious topics. And student, um, for example, if there's a student research project going on on campus, or faculty, or a vulnerable population you're working with, and by that I mean minors, um, that could include incarcerated individuals, it could include um, people who are undocumented. In that case, people may want to remain confident. They may, may want to remain um, anonymous and you would need to respect their confidentiality. So this is something you want to have a conversation with individuals before you, um, as part of the consent form process and before you start the interview and respect their confidentiality. So a few questions come up to me every time I sign this in my students' uh, classes, and these are great questions, which is, one, what if the interviewee does not like to talk? That is a possibility. Um, we really, again, some of the questions that I mentioned before should help you in trying to elicit a little bit more response. Um, one thing you can do is sort of try to get them to follow up a little bit. Can you say a little bit more about that? Asking them to recollect something that they found really interesting or something that, that they got excited about, um, that will help them to, to say a little bit more. And also, you know, don't, don't be afraid to spend a few minutes before you actually turn on the recorder getting to know that person, especially if it's the first time you've met in person. Talk to them a little bit, ask them about their lives. Um, it's important to get to know people because there is a degree of trust that goes into conducting oral history. So, so um, don't be surprised when people may not want to talk a lot. Um, there are instances where they will want to talk a lot. So um, to the second point, the second question, if they go off on a tangent, um, I think it's important in my own research and I teach students, it's important to listen, right, to active listening, not just of the things that we want to know for purposes of our own oral history mission or goals, but what do people want to share? What's important to them? So allow tangents to happen. Um, it's also important to kind of, you know, reel people back in when things go, you know, off for, for a good amount of time. Um, so it's actually a fine balance. And then that comes along with practice. But it's something to definitely uh, keep into consideration. Um, what if individuals do not answer questions? Well, there may be instances where, one, they choose not to, and in that case, it's important to respect that choice. Um, if they don't answer a question, you may think about reframing the question. Um, an example I've given my students in the past is when I worked with um, Latinas of the World War II generation who describe instances of um, racial discrimination, but I, not knowing a whole lot about conducting oral history early on in my my career, I would ask the question of, did you experience discrimination? And they would say no. But again, their experiences speak to that. And so it's important to think about the terminology we use um, in that people may not dis describe their experiences in certain ways, right? Or certain terms may not um, resonate with them. So, so really think about the kinds of questions you're asking and the terms that you're using when you ask those questions. So these are just a few brief considerations. Um, again, 
you, I could go on for hours and hours about how to conduct oral history. Um, but these are some things that I think are some sort of general considerations in thinking about oral history. Um, again, if anyone has questions in the q and A, I I would be happy to elaborate on any of these issues. But next, I'm going to go into a section on talking about two examples of the ways in which Southwestern University has conducted oral history projects. So I'm going to speak about the spirit stories, narratives of social justice and spirituality uh, oral history project that took place at Southwestern from 2012 to 2013. Um, again, why do these different projects? One, um, uh, these become inspired oftentimes by faculty research. In this case, I work with uh, Latinas and Chicanas, the who are involved in social justice activism in Texas, and particularly women involved in the Mexican American Civil Rights Movement. Luckily, my research is in Austin, so I've had the pleasure of introducing a lot of women that I've worked with in my research to our students. And this has been really exciting work to see this sort of intergenerational exchange of knowledge. So the Spirit Stories Project really, uh, it, it, coupled, as you see here, a couple of our students with uh, prominent leaders in the Mexican-American Civil Rights Movement in Texas. I took the students to the Raza Unida political party reunion in Austin, and they actually interviewed uh, participants from the movement there. And then they would come back to Southwestern and we would transcribe and analyze the interviews to understand the ways in which religion and spirituality and transformations and questioning of religion um, were reflected of women's material circumstances in life, right? And the ways in which religion, social justice, gender, um, and race all intersect and interact. So this is an example of the ways in which um, Oral history can be used to uh, also provide learning opportunities for students. Um, so this was a really exciting um, a project. We recorded about 15 hours worth of interviews with four um, activists, and then they later came and did a, a symposium, and we opened it up to the public. So again, oral history can make can take so many different kinds of, um, it can manifest in lots of different ways. Again, through exhibits, through symposiums, through publications, through presentations, um, and community events, um, and also film, also documentary film. Um, so through Spirit Stories, again, we were able to recover some of these histories. Um, women's participation in the Chicano movement is not always something that's highlighted, uh, rarely so actually, in Chicano movement narratives. And so it was important in my research and then to share with these women um, of both generations uh, the importance of um, understanding the contributions that, that Chicanas made to, uh, to social justice in, in Texas and to uh, inspiring equality for Mexican origin individuals. So the other project I'd like to share a little bit about is a project that we are engaging in currently here at Southwestern. That is the Latina History Project. And again, Charlotte Nunez is a key um, participant in this project. Um, she has helped to uh, teach students about the ideas behind the importance of archiving. And we are coupling that with conducting oral history. So, so the Latin History Project is a collaboration. It's funded by the Summer Lee Foundation. It's a three-year grant um, whereby we are able to work with um, four students, um, currently three students and one alum, to delve into the history of uh, Latina activism, um, educational involvement, and lots of other involvement um, in Texas history. Uh, Central Texas really doesn't have uh, a lot of emphasis in terms of um, representation in historical literature. So we thought it would be very important to, being that we are situated in Central Texas, not only do research on the Central section, te central Texas region, but also collect oral histories of our own community here at Southwestern, both inside and outside the academic um, experience. Um, so of the community in Georgetown, but also within the Latino experience of our uh, student faculty and staff. So the Latina History Project um, provides this connection between the past, present, and future Southwestern uh, and Georgetown, Texas Latinos um, through the work of the students. Um, so we have here another thing you can do with oral history, and I can provide the link to the Latin History Project on the True Stories page, but um, is to provide a website. And so what we did is to, and primarily the students and Charlotte, is to um, 
use archival materials from an exhibit that was produced in the 1990s at Southwestern called uh, Rostros y Almas, Faces and Souls. Um, and they did, the students have spent hours and hours digitizing really interesting materials as part of the Latina History Project. And they've re reproduced this into a physical exhibit with the assistance of um, our archival staff, Jason Dean and the library here. So we actually have an exhibit based on some of these archives um, out in the library. So that's another thing, another exhibit is an, an, another outcome of oral histories. Um, and we're also collecting oral histories. So it's really exciting to couple students with alum, for example, um, to have them share their experiences. We had two students interview alum who came to Southwestern who were Latinos um, from the early 1960s and to really see what it was like being a Mexican origin individual here and then what it's like, you know, 40 years later. So that was a really interesting learning experience for the students and also I think for myself and to learn about sort of this history that isn't always part of this, like I said, a larger historical narrative narrative, right? But that's just as, just as important. So these multi-generational oral histories serve to both document and reflect on the experiences um, of individuals as they go through uh, life in Texas as uh, Mexican origin, Latino, um, women, men, students, um, people with lots of different um, experiences uh, who come together and what that experience is like. Um, so far, the oral history interviews, um, we've collected a handful and we uh, will collect more. Uh, for example, we will be having a symposium for annual feminist studies um, lecture this year, and we will have three prominent Chicano movement activists who the students will also interview to make part, which will become part of our archive here at Southwestern. So there are lots of different um, opportunities for engaging in oral history as learning opportunities, as helping to reconstruct the past, and also um, create academic research. So that concludes my presentation portion of this webinar. I hope that you have found some of this brief uh, presentation useful and that it encourages you to explore your own family's history, an aspect of your community's history, or to consider using oral history as a research method in your next project or course. Thank you so much, and I look forward to fielding your questions at this time. So if you've got a question, just uh, put it in the group chat box in your Zoom application, and uh, we'll all be able to see them, and then I'll read them aloud uh, so that we can hear it in the recording, and Dr. Sandejo will answer. So we have a question from Rachel Walton about multilingual oral history projects. Mm. She's still typing. <laughs> um, okay, so she's asking about difficulties in um, translation. Um, so when you're, you're, say, I don't know, I'm going to work up from Rachel's question here and say you've got someone that you're interviewing that uses that English is not their first language mm -hmm. um, and it's not necessarily a language that you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, do you recommend that? Do you recommend somebody that kind of can help you through those maybe um, less formal terms and does that change the dynamic of the interview? That's a great question. Um, so we actually had, this is, um, something that occurred when students started on the Latina History Project, they actually were transcribing an oral history interview um, with one of the first uh, members of the family who were Mexican-American who came to Georgetown. And I believe there was a, um, a translator who was translating for that interview. I think that in my own experience, um, I have done both. I've used, my Spanish is not excellent. Um, and so it's not my first language. And so I have, conducted interviews in Spanish, and I felt like there was something that was very important. I did that in Oaxaca with a, a, um, a curandera, a folk healer, and at the time, I felt like it was important to connect with that individual, um, and so I did use my own Spanish. I don't feel like I got 100% of everything that she said, but at that, so I recorded it, and I went back, and then I, I 
sort of transcribed it and that sort of thing and translated it. Um, so that's one method. I probably wouldn't, now that my Spanish is better, it'd probably be a different experience. Um, but I felt like it was very important at that time. Um, and so I think it's on a case by case basis. Um, I think there can be something, it depends on the topic. Again, when talking about spirituality and healing, I felt like it was really important to try to connect as much as I can in Spanish and the native language with that individual. Um, but I don't think there's anything wrong with using translators. Um, it will change the dynamic a little bit, but I think that that also gives the person, you can fully understand everything that they're communicating to you. Um, and I think that's absolutely something that's, that's um, yeah, absolutely um, a, a technique to use. Thank you. Does anybody else have any other questions for the chat box? So another question from Rachel, and this is a good one, I'm curious about this. So do you tend to provide questions in advance to any of your interviewees who might feel they need to be prepared for your questions? Absolutely, um, I do that uh, with my own research um, because I think it's good to give individuals sort of a sense of the direction. Um, I wouldn't get too detailed with those because I feel that um, some of that kind of um, I think that might kind of have people think too deeply about their answers and memory works in interesting ways in that regard. And so um, I think sort of speaking off the cuff has also got its valid um, uses as well. Um, but I do give general senses of the question. So around religion and spirituality, things that I would ask are, can you, can you explain your particular religious and spiritual practices growing up? Can you explain um, any moments of transition or of transformation around your spiritual experience or path? Um, Having said that, I actually was interviewed by a student, and you know, you really can't even prepare that much with general questions because, um, and that's another thing I would recommend. If you are considering oral history, have someone interview you or, or, or volunteer to be part of an oral history project. It really gives you insight into how, how challenging it actually can be to um, be interviewed because you, you know, you're posed with questions that you may not think about, I mean, even something as general as what is spirituality? I had to really think about that. And I studied that. I studied that for years. But from my own personal experience, I really had to think about what that meant for me. Um, and so to that regard, I feel like the best that you can and prepare individuals in terms of the topics you're going to explore that would be great but the intricacies of your questions one you may not even know what some of those are going to be they may come out of the interview itself um, if it's the first time you're interviewing somebody um, they may end up bringing up something you had no idea they were going to bring up um, so that would be a wonderful kind of um, unexpected instance that came out of the interview um, but not getting too detailed I think is really important in the questions that you not only ask but that you provide ahead of time but some sense of the interview I think is really helpful for people to start kind of getting their their brains around sort of uh, the direction that you like to go in, in the um, in the interview okay, one more question um, what about using photos or newspaper clippings as con conversation starters is that influencing the interviewee too much or can it help lead the discussion in a good direction I've always found it can help lead the discussion in a good direction um, we consider those um, or other objects cultural artifacts in anthropology. So I think the idea of using a newspaper clip or photographs can elicit some really, one, memories. I mean, it really taps into people's memories to bring a photo perhaps of someone who has meant a lot to them in their life or a photo of a place that meant a lot to them. I often ask people to bring those sorts of things to interviews and then talk to me about them um, within the context of the interview. Um, with regards to, again, religion and spirituality, I'll often be in someone's home and ask them to talk a little bit about a particular image or icon or religious symbol. And that really will tell you a lot about a person um, that perhaps a question 
can't necessarily elicit, right? The other thing to think about that this brings up is the idea um, of emotion, right? Um, that certain kinds of, of memories and images can raise different kinds of feelings for people. And that's a really important part of the oral history is understanding the responses that people have to their experiences in life in different places and different individuals. So I absolutely think that those kinds of tools are really helpful in one, bringing people having, showing what's important to them by asking them to bring things to the interview. But then also, you know, you might think about perhaps it's a historical um, you bring up a historical photograph of a period that that person was alive during and see what, you know, what kinds of uh, memories that elicits, just a general photograph. So there are different ways that you can use those, but I think I highly recommend them and I think they're really effective. Excellent. Thank you. Do we have any other questions folks have in the audience? Another good question, um, talking about format, <clears throat> is it effective to capture the interviews on video if the emo emotional reactions of the participants are important mm -hmm. to your interview? When I worked with the U.S. Latino World War II project, which is now the Voces project, um, we used video. Um, and I think that, it I think it depends on the purpose that you're using it for. So those kinds of videos were made into documentaries. So as a big fan of documentary and ethnographic film, and I think they're effective and accessible and in relaying information, I think that video is really important. Having said that, people don't always have access to cameras. That's another layer of technology to deal with. And also, um, it can also, when you're trying to have an interview with someone, the situation is not always ideal. I mean, you, you may end up doing it in obscure places like, you know, someone's office with air conditioning running really loud. You can't do it. You, you want to minimize those sorts of things, but you can only control the environment in so many ways. So the addition of a video camera um, may not logistically be really feasible. Having said that, I think that if you plan to use um, documentary, if you plan to do a presentation, the video clip is really, I think, effective and also to give people faces, you know, have their images and their faces and their their emotions and their their eyes represented is also a whole nother way of um, communicating knowledge about that inf that individual. And I, I do think that it could be really effective. So, again, it, it depends on what you have access to uh, your interview situation um, and what you plan to do with the video. Do you think the addition of a camera changes the the mechanic, not the mechanics, but the, the dynamics, uh, the dynamics mm -hmm. of the interview. I think it does, but I think it depends on who you're interviewing because I work with women who've been in the political, um, the public realm for so long that that doesn't really affect them as much. But having said that, someone who isn't used to being interviewed or, or if the topic is somewhat sensitive, those are things that might influence whether or not you choose to use video. But it definitely can change the dynamic, as with, you know, documentary filmmaking, right? When people have a camera following them around, at first it can be very difficult and you're very aware that it's there, but then it gets a little bit easier. But if you're doing an oral history interview and it's, you know, an hour or two hours long, um, it, can, it can really depend. But again, if you're going to do that, I think that it can be done. Like I said, with the, the oral histories around World War II, we did those, and they were usually... They were usually fine, um, but I think spending a little bit more time on the front end, making people comfortable and talking about them while the camera is set up is one way to help kind of make them more comfortable with that kind of setting. So yeah, those are good questions, yeah. I think we've probably got time for maybe one more question. Okay. If anybody's got one. Um, just a reminder that the recording of this webinar is going to be available on the Latina History Project, and it will probably also be available, uh, Rachel can speak more to this, uh, as a part of the True Stories grant as well. Um, we don't have any further questions, so I want to thank Dr. Sandejo. I found this fascinating. Uh, a lot of what I do deals with paper and not uh, oral histories, and so this is a fascinating perspective into another side of the house that I know not enough about. So thank you, Dr. Sandejo, and I'd like to thank all the participants. 
uh, for coming today and uh, hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you, Jason. Thank you.